Hi. In this lecture, we're going to talk about developing and designing survey questionnaire instruments. In the last lecture, we talked about some of the features of survey research. To design a successful research project, it's really dependent on two features. The first is carefully selecting a sample. Um, and, and that means identifying people from your target population and interviewing them, enabling them to take part in your study. But those people are representative of the target population. If you're carefully selecting a, a sample for your study, you can be more confident that what you find from those people will be able to generalize back to the target population that you're interested in. The second feature that a survey question, um, successful survey research is dependent on is a well-designed survey questionnaire. Without a well-designed survey questionnaire, it's unlikely that you'll yield valid and reliable responses. But if you carefully develop the survey questions, you'll be able to capture meaningful answers consistently across people in your sample. And this, these systematic procedures that go into developing a survey questionnaire is what we're going to talk about in this lecture. We'll talk about some of the, the basic ways and things to think about as you're developing a survey. Before we jump into the details of survey design, I want to mention that survey design is, is actually very difficult and a creative process. It's sort of one part art and one part science. Um, the art part of designing surveys is that survey designers have to sort of think about how the survey is designed, the order, the flow, um, the layout of survey questions within the questionnaire. But there's also kind of the essence of a survey, which is that you're trying to just sort of distill social life into a set of words and phrases that you can use to collect information from people. And that's a lot more difficult than it sounds. And so there's, a, there's definitely an art to sort of designing meaningful questions that connect with people and, you know, allow them to provide the most thoughtful answers, but also um, kind of thinking about the order of how questions are administered. There's also a science component, and the science component has to do with making sure that you're capturing valid and reliable responses. So the questions are um, sort of capturing core measures in your study. They're, they're re they have high reliability in the sense that people respond to similar questions in the same way. So there, there's definitely a science component as well as an art component to the survey design process. One of the things that is often overlooked in surveys is sort of the ordering and the flow of survey questions. Um, a carefully designed survey will have similar questions grouped together with one another. There's also careful attention to the placement of survey questions within the questionnaire. So background or demographic questions are usually placed at the end of a survey. And likewise, routine or sensitive questions um, are usually not answer, um, not asked at the beginning of a survey. Um, usually, um, you might ask sensitive questions in the middle of a survey. Um, you don't want to sort of start or end with those types of questions. Um, you also want to sort of think about how you're introducing questions to people and whether their responses to earlier questions will affect re later question, um, responses. Because topics appear, that questions that are asked, topics that are discussed early in a survey interview might affect how the respondent thinks about questions later on. Um, and related to question ordering is that general questions are more susceptible to order effects than specific questions. So order effects are kind of the, how the placement of a survey question affects maybe respondents later answers and general questions seem to be more susceptible to those types of effects rather than survey rather than specific questions two broad categories of survey questions are open-ended questions um, and closed-ended questions open-ended questions are those that require respondents to answer in their own words. So rather than providing a fixed set of respond responses, re 
survey respondents are able to sort of think about what that question means and provide a response that doesn't necessarily fit into a particular box. In contrast, close-ended questions require respondents to choose their responses from a list of options. Um, so you can think about a if you were asking, if you were conducting a political poll and you wanted to gather information about how people feel about um, the president's performance in office, you could ask an open-ended question, how would you rate the president's performance in office so far? Or you could ask a close-ended question by including the response categories poor, below average, average, above average, and excellent. Um, so it kind of depends on the, the type and the quality of information that you're looking to gather. Open-ended questions have a few advantages. Um, some of the advantages are that respondents have freedom to choose their own responses, and it kind of re reveals the logic and the thinking processes that people put into those questions. Um, people often provide very rich and varied responses, including ones that are not weren't thought about um, by the research team. So respondents might actually provide uh, new emergent data that the researchers hadn't thought about. Um, so opening new questions kind of kind of yield uh, rich responses. Um, um, Open-ended questions do require um, that interviewers are sort of able to recognize ambiguities and probe answers. Um, the disadvantages are that responses can be sometimes v uh, very long or very short and sometimes the grammatical quality of responses um, is difficult, uh, it's, you know, not, not very high quality. And um, one of the big disadvantages of open-ended questions is that they require a lot of work by both the research team to sort of review all of those responses, to code and make sense of them, to do some type of content analysis and understand the range, um, the codes and the themes from those responses. But also, it's, it, it requires more work of the respondents, too, because the respondents have to think about answers to these open-ended questions. It takes more time um, to think about an answer um, versus a closed-ended question where they can kind of respond quickly. You know, kind of weighing these advantages and disadvantages, some of the takeaways are that uh, researchers should really um, use caution in including open-ended questions in a survey questionnaire. Most of the time, a survey questionnaire will include um, a heavier uh, amount of closed-ended questions. Open-ended question, questions can really um, hamper the analysis of survey data. Um, they can add considerable length to the survey interview. Uh, for these reasons, res um, you know, researchers kind of might want to use these questions sparingly, if at all. Closed-ended questions are a lot easier for people to um, answer. They require less thought and effort. Um, the standardization of the response options provides the same frame of reference for all respondents. So you're kind of enabling people who are responding to your survey to think about those questions in the same way by offering a set of responses. Um, interviewers do have to sort of, um, you know, think about um, and sort of sometimes guide Res, uh, respondents and answering survey questions. Closed-ended questions are um, difficult to develop. It's sometimes it's easy to omit important responses that the researchers didn't think about, and so this forces respondents to have to choose alternatives because maybe something that they would have responded to isn't listed. And interestingly, uh, researchers have found that um, even if there's an other category where you can write in a response. Um, people don't usually use that other category. They'll try to sort of fit themselves into the categories that are listed. So for these reasons, it's really important to make sure that you have an exhaustive set of responses that capture sort of the range of things that respondents might think about and respond to. Um, because survey um, closed-ended survey questions can be difficult to develop, um, if the researcher is limited, has, has to get a survey up and running quickly, or they don't have a lot of resources to pilot test a survey, um, if, if you don't do a lot of pre-testing, it's difficult um, to yield really good questions, because a lot of great survey questions come about through sort of um, careful, iterative, um, and revision process. Um, however, 
Um, you can kind of have a green light with closed-ended survey questions. Um, they're relatively um, easy for respondents to answer. You can quantitatively code responses and do statistical analysis. Um, there are standard questionnaires that you can look at and review that other researchers have developed and sort of use similar questions as long as there's sort of not a copyright on using those questions so you can kind of maybe you don't have to reinvent the wheel all the time you can use questions that were developed by other researchers uh, for these reasons closed-ended questions are usually the way to go with survey design and um, most surveys include you know the vast majority of questions are closed-ended questions there are a few things to take into account when you're um, writing the wording of survey questions. You want to be careful to have very precise and succinct wording and that there's clarity in the phrases and the wording that you're using. Um, so clarity, precision, and succinct wording are really essential qualities of survey items. Some, a question like, how many years have you been living here, is very vague. Respondents might not know what you mean by here. Um, do you mean in this state, in this house, in this neighborhood? Um, you know, there can be many different answers, so it's not a very clear and precise wording. Um, another sort of pitfall of survey design is um, using what, what are called double-barreled questions. And these are survey questions that you want to avoid because a double-barreled survey question uh, references two or more issues in the same question. For example, um, one question, do you believe that for every dollar of tax increase there should be two dollars in spending cuts with the savings earmarked for deficit and debt reduction? This survey question is actually asking about two different issues. Um, one, what it's asking about whether you should attach um, spending cuts to tax increases. Um, and likewise, they're also asking you if you should earmark those spending cuts for deficit and debt reduction. So there's sort of two separate questions here, and it can really confuse respondents about sort of which, which one are they responding to. Um, so you can have that ambiguity in your responses. The other issue is to really avoid leading your respondents to answer one way or another. Um, leading questions sort of um, nudge people to sort of respond in a more positive or a more negative way. For instance, how satisfied were you with your HMO plan in 2017? Um, this assumes that people are satisfied. Um, you might just have people sort of um, assign a rating to their HMO plan and sort of keep it neutral. Um, so this, this question is sort of leading people to maybe indicate greater satisfaction with their health insurance plan. Um, one way to go with response formats. So responses are often sort of the overlooked um, aspect of survey design. Um, and so some of the, um, the sort of, somebody who hasn't developed a lot of surveys in the past might have a tendency to include a lot of yes and no responses. And this, this is appropriate for some questions. However, there are not a lot of aspects of social life that can sort of be grouped into dichotomies. Um, and so for this reason, uh, response formats become really important. And Likert response scales are some of the commonly used ways um, to sort of measure attitudes and beliefs. You can look at an agreement scale or a rating scale or a satisfaction scale to sort of capture somebody's position on a particular attitude or belief. So Likert response options are great. Um, standardized responses um, that have been sort of tested in prior surveys provide valid and reliable answers.